I'm Lisa Diller. I'm a pediatric oncologist with um, uh, an interest both in neuroblastoma and in survivorship. I was a little disappointed. Uh, this has been a fantastic meeting. I was a little disappointed that there were only uh, really two abstracts presented in the poster sessions this year that were direct sort of survivorship research abstracts. And I look forward to over the coming neuroblastoma meetings, ANR meetings, that as we have more and more survivors, we have more and more to say about our patients and what happens to them. The major questions um, that I'd like to address this afternoon in uh, survivorship, uh, first of all, does risk-adapted therapy improve late effects profile in the non-high-risk patients? We've done reduction of therapy protocols. Have we seen a reduction in late effects? As more high-risk patients survive longer, what's the outcome for them and what do we know? What have we learned so far about the late effects of newer therapies? And can we identify novel risk factors and prevention strategies to reduce long-term morbidity? And I will try to tell you a little bit about the abstracts that are presented here today that have relevance to survivorship, have been presented at this meeting. So let's start with risk-adapted risk therapy improving late effect profiles. As you know, there's been a reduction of, um, of therapy studies in, uh, addressed to reduce, mostly addressing reduction of late effects in patients who do not have high-risk therapy. There have been high-risk disease. There have been multiple clinical trials worldwide which support this strategy of reduction of therapy. The, uh, main, the mainstay of these trials are to avoid radiation, avoid surgery when unnecessary, and reduction of chemotherapy total doses to minimize long-term sequelae. For example, the um, COG conducted a trial, intermediate risk COG A3961, which took intermediate risk patients and gave them four to eight cycles of chemotherapy with um, active agents in neuroblastoma, carboplatin, etoposide, doxorubicin, and cyclophosphamide. And the drugs were uh, chosen to alternate and to have total doses, none of which would result in expected um, high risk of long-term toxicity. The total doses of alkylators, for example, were expected to um, be associated with no risk of infertility, no cardiac disease associated with the anthracycline dose, and minimal risk of hearing or renal disease with carboplatin. There was a fair bit of etoposide exposure, and the question about secondary leukemia has been raised. Here are the data from that study, which was published um, a while ago, but is worth looking at in terms of what we're thinking about now. Patients who were intermediate risk and received four cycles of chemotherapy, there were 200 of those. You can see the total dose of etoposide and doxorubicin, which is also leukemogenic, and there were no cases of AML seen. However, among the patients who received eight cycles, you can see maybe a dose response there, where as we increase the etoposide dose, we do see a few cases of AML. Perhaps our next step in these patients is to eliminate um, the use of uh, leukemogenic agents. However, we did um, uh, establish that this reduction of therapy had no detrimental effect on long-term survival. And this is comparing that study that I just referenced to the prior CCG study, which used much more aggressive therapy for a similar group of patients. So what are the next steps for non-high-risk patients? Really to determine who needs no therapy, and Europeans have done um, perhaps a better job of that than we have on our side of the Atlantic, and to expand eligibility for observation only. Also, I think we need to improve care for conditions that are associated with late toxicity but are not necessarily looked at carefully um, in survivorship studies, and those include oxyclonus myoclonus syndrome and spinal cord compression, both of which were addressed in abstracts at this meeting. Second major question I'd like to talk about is, as more high-risk patients survive longer, what's the outcome for them? So what do we know? Unfortunately, we really have a very limited good information to understand the overall risks in our survivors. Why is this? Mostly published are limited case series with limited, are multiple case series from single or multiple institution studies with limited sample size, relatively short follow-up, especially when one is looking for the effects of more modern therapies. For example, therapies that didn't involve higher, uh, higher doses of uh, radiation, TBI, higher doses of uh, chemotherapy. Multiple designs have been used to assess late effects, including self-reported morbidity, patients telling you what they have experienced, clinical screening, where patients come in and have certain outcomes measured, and chart review, which we know can be fraught with um, missing information. 
However, this does represent international approaches to treatment over many decades. I did look at those um, multiple publications. These are the major ones in the literature um, uh, from around the world. Uh, here you can see that here. These are really from around the world, um, representing North American, European, and uh, Australian experience. Um, looking at toxicity after high-risk neuroblastoma, and these are just percentages reported in each of these case series. Um, and one can deduce a few things from this uh, bar graph. One is that there's a wide range of how one might characterize limitations in specific organ function, for example, growth or gonadal function. That hypothyroidism is seen pretty uniformly or um, at about 50%, and that hearing loss is a big problem. The other thing you see is if you don't measure it, you don't know if it's there. So there are many patients for whom we know nothing about their pulmonary function, their cardiac function, their renal function, for example. In those 233 patients that are reported in those multiple case series, there are 33 second malignant neoplasms reported. Um, these include um, myelodysplasia and AML, sarcomas, not exclusively in the irradiated areas, thyroid disease, hepatic tumors, multiple carcinomas, mostly abdominal but not exclusively, and um, an ependymoma and a pheochromocytoma. I think we need to be looking as our long-term survivors uh, uh, get on in age. Um, thankfully, we will be having some based upon the data that was presented in this meeting and the successful results of a number of uh, aggressive randomized trials for high-risk patients that will be need to be looking for these late effects. So what are the themes emerging in the high-risk patients? Um, one is short stature and poor growth with a prevalence anywhere between 7% and 100%. It's evident that this is not um, isolated in patients exposed to total body irradiation. There's some sort of growth arrest in many survivors of high-risk neuroblastoma that did not receive TBI. And it doesn't appear to be um, always growth hormone responsive. There are limited reports of patients receiving growth hormone, but growth hormone responsiveness has not been, uh, unresponsiveness has been observed in these patients, suggesting some other end organ damage, which one might expect given that the risk for actual pituitary dysfunction should be pretty low in our patients. Hypothyroidism, which appears to be associated with therapeutic radiation, um, MIBG therapy, and perhaps MIBG or CT scan burden in these patients abnormal glucose metabolism, and delayed or abnormal pubertal development, and certainly infertility. Abnormal glucose metabolism was observed by our group. We looked at hemoglobin A1C levels in a group of long-term survivors. You can see in the uh, distribution curve here that um, this is the group, the uh, normal distribution that you would expect of hemoglobin A1C in an age-matched group, and this was the distribution in our long-term survivors. What's the etiology of this? This is not really clear, uh, totally clear, but there was a report um, by the Dutch group looking at pancreatic radiation or abdominal radiation as a major determinant of, of potential uh, metabolic syndrome and abnormal glucose metabolism. They looked at radiation, um, pancreatic involvement in radiation sites for neuroblastoma patients. And then they also did a analysis of patients who received abdominal radiation, um, who did not receive abdominal radiation versus those who did. And these are the number of components, you may not be able to see this, but these are the number of components of the metabolic syndrome showing that patients who received metabolic, who had um, abdominal radiation were much more likely to have multiple components of the metabolic syndrome compared to patients um, who did not receive abdominal radiation like this group who had no, no or only one component of the metabolic syndrome. The other theme emerging is second tumors. Um, certainly, radiation-induced tumors are, are expected to increase over time. These will include osteosarcoma and soft tissue sarcomas. Abdominal radiation will likely emerge as a culprit for abdominal cancers, including colon cancer, hepatic cancers, and renal cancers. That there are new cancer predisposition syndromes emerging, and that not all solid tumors are associated with radiation. Myeloid leukemias are nearly all restricted to the first 10 years and even earlier, and benign growths are seen frequently, and it depends upon how, um, how carefully you look for them. This is an example of a um, focal no evidence of focal nodular hyperplasia in a patient who's had uh, imaging for follow-up of neuroblastoma. A common finding um, anywhere between uh, what was reported this, at this meeting was 6% in the European group and really uh, brought out the... Um, the notion that uh, the more you look, the more you find. And um, this is an osteochondroma, which has been a problem noted in uh, long-term survivors of multiple cancers, including neuroblastoma. 
There was a recent report on um, acquired multiple cysts of the kidney and neuroblastoma survivors from the Penn group, where seven long-term survivors of high-risk neuroblastoma were found to have multiple kidney cysts. They did not have the cysts at diagnosis, as seen here, but they developed over time. These had no family history of renal cyst-associated disease. And the question whether is, the, is this a new toxicity of therapy versus a predisposition syndrome? So what we really need is a large cohort of high-risk neuroblastoma survivors to develop a better understanding of outcomes, and we've start to, started to develop that in the children's oncology group. We took the data from the COGANBLOOB1, which is our biology study that has been open since 2000, and we identified all the high-risk patients who were enrolled on that study between 2000 and 2009. 2009 was chosen at the time we assembled this cohort because it gave us a, um, uh, an ability to look at the five-year and beyond point, and we will be extending this uh, cohort as uh, it takes longer and longer to open the study that I will describe to you. However, we found in the um, biology study group that there were um, 1,903 high-risk patients, uh, survivors enrolled in the study. Of those, 722 were found to be alive at five years, and 459 were described as having no event in the data we could um, obtain from the biology study. When we characterized those five-year survivors, they were fairly typical um, for high-risk neuroblastoma patients. Their median age of diagnosis was 2.6 years. Their current age was nice and young for assembling a cohort because they're under the control of their parents for the most part. We can get them in and get information. Um, about 40% were enrolled on an upfront clinical trial, and there was a nice variability in exposures if we want to look at the relationship between exposures and outcome. With a little less than half had been treated with immunotherapy, almost all with cisretinoic acid, and three quarters of them had been in follow-up in a COG center in the last year. And this is shown here. So the first thing we did is uh, um, what, when one deals with survivors, I'm sure those of you who are clinically um, engaged with survivors, the first thing you ask yourself was what's the likelihood that my long-term survivor is actually cured of their primary disease? So we looked at the overall survival in these five-year survivors of uh, the overall survival at 10 years. If you're a five-year survivor, what's the likelihood that you'll be alive at 10 years? That was 81 point, um, 81%. And um, there were 79 deaths after the five years, and the major cause of death was neuroblastoma. Um, the other causes of death included second cancer, pulmonary disease, infection, and GVH, and presumably a patient who had an allo transplant. Um, the event-free survival in those 459 that I told you about who had not had an event before was 87%, which is an um, encouraging um, outcome in a group of patients in terms of uh, being able to reassure ourselves that the uh, curve, although it does still go down, this, this is at the five-year point essentially, it still goes down by 10 years, it, uh, it's starting to flatten out. We then, um, we then put together a um, great acronym, I think, Late Effects After High-Risk Neuroblastoma, or the LEARN study, which is a COG study that is um, uh, on its way to opening. The primary aims of the study are to estimate the prevalence of organ dysfunction, second cancer, growth impairment, abnormal pubertal development, and neurobehavioral function in survivors of high-risk neuroblastoma to identify the demographic, clinical, and treatment-related risk factors associated with these abnormalities, and to look at the impact of, those organ dis of that organ dysfunction, physical um, growth dysfunction, and pubertal development and neurobehavioral function on their overall health-related quality of life. The secondary aim is biobanking, to establish a, latest, a late effects annotated cohort of high-risk neuroblastoma survivors treated with modern therapy since the year 2000 with stored peripheral blood samples as a resource for future investigation. And this will be available with information about the survivors and the late effects they've experienced over the years going forward. This is a cross-sectional non-therapeutic study with a target enrollment of 367. It will involve patients coming back to a COG institution and having a full-day clinical evaluation with documentation of the exposures by the treating clinician or a CRA, um, looking at both primary therapy, relapse therapy, and second cancer treatments when relevant, and looking at the number of MIBG scans that the patient received. <clears throat> 
Um, we will also measure outcomes, including health conditions, confirmed by the provider, by laboratory and radiographic studies. And the patients will be asked to complete standardized questionnaires or their parents, depending upon age, about their health-related quality of life. This is funded by a St. Baldrick's Foundation Consortium Award. Going on to our next question, what have we learned so far about late effects of what we might call the newer therapies, although many of them have been around for a long time? One is stem cell transplant. Are there differences by conditioning regimen? I-131 MIBG and diagnostic MIBG become um, interesting in terms of late effects. Isotretinoin, immunotherapy, ALK inhibitors. We really know very little about any of these, but I'll tell you what we've learned. Um, presented here at the meeting um, today, some of you may have heard Dr. Applebaum talk about the cumulative incidence of second cancers. And he showed a relatively low um, cumulative incidence. Um, he cited a, a number of 1.8% at 10 years for high-risk survivors of neuroblastoma. But he did look at diagnosis after 1997, which he, I'm not sure he mentioned in his talk, but it's in his um, abstract that after 1997, the risk of a second cancer was associated with an almost two-fold increased risk of second cancer. Uh, the, uh, did I say that right? Um, and this was his estimate of when we started to do stem cell transplant, so that as we intensified risk, we probably intensified or increased the risk of developing a second cancer, even with a shorter follow-up. How about MIBG late effects? Almost all treated patients who have received MIBG have multiple other exposures, so it's very hard to tease out exactly what the effect of MIBG is. Um, thyroid disease is certainly observed with a wide range of incidence from 7% to 85%, and thyroid nodules have been seen as high as 25% in one series. Second cancers have been reported, including MDS, AML, malignant sarcoma, schwannoma, and mesothelioma, suggesting an unusual spectrum of secondary cancers. And there is an abstract to, uh, being presented today, I believe, on the incidence and risk factors for second cancers after I-131 MIBG treatment. Really, the, the, um, the, uh, the major uh, conclusion of that abstract is we need to wait longer and get more information and be very careful about charting uh, second cancer so that we understand the risk. There was a recent report of hypogonadism, gonadal failure in girls who received MIBG. Um, and this is a particularly interesting one because you can isolate in the Dutch group the fact that they receive MIBG early and they saw this early. So it seems to be associated with MIBG and showing the MIBG uptake that may actually be near the ovaries. How about isotretinoin long-term toxicity? There's a lot of experience with use of retinoids in older children and adults. It's been used for acne and rosacea and other dermatologic disorders for quite some time. And the observed late effects in those group include osteophyte, osteophyte formation, growth inhibition with premature epiphyseal closure, ligamental calcification, and generalized osteopenia. There's a single report in the neuroblastoma literature of advanced bone age in retinoid-treated patients uh, in patients who've received retinoid versus those who did not receive retinoids with high-risk neuroblastoma. And at this meeting, um, uh, at this ANR meeting, and I expect that we'll be seeing more of this in the future, there were two abstracts presented, the two late effects abstracts that I referred to, uh, posters that I referred to. Um, one uh, reported on two patients with premature epiphyseal uh, closure, limb they limb length discrepancy and angular deformity after I-131, MIBG treatment, high dose therapy and stem cell transplant, isotretinoin, and prolonged exposure to fenretinide, another um, retinoid. A second poster was um, able to really look at a proportion of patients. They reviewed 111 patients and found three cases with physeal arrest, valgus deformity, and all of those patients, all three of them had received isotretinoin exposure. The age at exposure was seven years. Perhaps it represents a little bit older group, and that may end up being a risk factor. The bone deformity occurred between one and three years after exposure, and all three patients required surgery. How about immunotherapy? There's really no reported significant late effects so far from anti-GD2 immunotherapy that I'm aware of. There are acute complications that have been reported with potential long-term implications. One is cases, there have been cases observed with persistent pupillary defects um, uh, uh, that are observed during therapy that don't resolve. They generally are asymptomatic. PRESS has been described as an acute complication of the antibody used at Memorial Sloan Kettering, the 3F8 antibody, with higher risk if there's been prior radiation to the brain. 
and clinical signs, uh, and then as a negative, one might have uh, worried about clinical signs of damage, long-term damage to peripheral nerves after anti-GD2 therapy, but that has not been observed. There's really no data yet on cellular immune therapy or other immunotherapeutic strategies that have been used in neuroblastoma. How about ALK inhibition? What will be the long-term toxicity? There's really no data on long-term ALK, uh, ALK inhibitor effects in children. Obviously, prolonged TKI use in children um, is expected, perhaps based upon the mechanism of action, to, pr to impact upon growth and possibly organ function. And there certainly have been adult toxicities usually associated with discontinuation of the drug, so it's hard to know in um, what the long-term effects will be or would be. But those include visual disturbance, renal cysts, in interstitial lung disease, and hepatotoxicity. And that lastly and briefly, can we identify novel risk factors and prevention strategies to reduce long-term morbidity? Um, one thing one might want to look at, as been, has been a focus in this meeting, is the genetic risk for late effects, including second cancers. Unfortunately, there's a lack of availability of large numbers of samples that are well annotated for late effects, and this is a barrier to a determining associations. We often have large collections of germline DNA and then poorly annotated for things like hearing loss or second cancers. And there's a real risk of biasing one's results or uh, making false conclusions without really being able to categorize patients as having the late toxicity or not. However, um, second cancer risk um, is uh, of a concern, and there, it's uh, logical to expect that there will be groups of patients at higher risk for second cancers, as has been observed in other diseases. Germline polymorphisms in DNA repair genes were described by Dr. Alpabaum this morning as possibly associated with risk. There's ongoing whole exome sequencing in large cohorts, including the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, which is a large study of North American five-year survivors of childhood cancer and includes all primary diagnoses, including uh, neuroblastoma patients. And then, of course, there's emerging awareness of the risk of a cancer predisposition associated with neuroblastoma. Dr. Diskin presented this morning. Some of you may heard, have heard her say that um, somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of patients who have neuroblastoma probably have an underlying cancer predisposition that might be expected to be associated with a higher risk of second cancers. What about platinum-related hearing loss? Um, this has been a difficult one to um, hone in on. There have been multiple reports, both in the adult and pediatric literature, looking at genetic variants that might predispose to being more sensitive to platinum, both um, uh, renal disease and hearing disease. They've been hired to replicate, um, and there are multiple candidate genes, and I think the jury is still out and will rely um, highly on having large numbers of patients with, that are well adentated for hearing loss. However, these do, this does represent a potential strategy for prevention of late effects. Can we personalize therapy based on host genotype? For example, could polymorphisms for ototoxicity and or second cancer guide therapeutic choices? We're not 100% sure, for example, that patients with high-risk neuroblastoma during consolidation therapy actually need the radiation, the local radiation that's used in North America, perhaps selecting out those patients who are at highest risk for secondary cancer but based upon an underlying genetic risk might be the patients in whom those, that kind of radiation is avoided. Similarly, um, this is a study published in, the, in JCO by Wendy Landier um, using COG data. Um, this is the proportion of patients who um, had uh, hearing loss needing a hearing aid or no hearing aid who received um, cisplatin at uh, less than 400 milligrams per meter squared. Mm -hmm. If we knew what polymorphism a patient had that put them at risk for going on after receiving uh, carboplatin during a, uh, a stem cell transplant that leads them to go on and need a hearing aid, maybe these are the patients who should have an alternative transplant regimen. So I think we need to also consider genotype in the long-term follow-up surveillance guidelines. Germline cancer predisposition and late organ, toxi late organ toxicity might be associated, uh, more associated with certain genotypes than others and change the uh, follow-up screening recommendations. So as we more and more expect cure um, for patients with high-risk neuroblastoma in particular, as well as patients with non-high risk, this presents opportunities for research and for improvement of care. This, um, for example, we need to think more and more in high-risk patients about fertility preservation 
uh, before therapy, which has become uh, a, uh, a difficult question for many clinicians um, and is not a subject, as far as I know, of any particular research study. We need to think about the limitation on use of radiotherapy, as I uh, mentioned, including um, patient selection who really needs radiotherapy, or um, increasing the use of more targeted radiotherapy, such as proton beam. And then odor protection trials. There's an ongoing study of uh, odor protective agents, uh, both in Europe and the United States, to see whether we can use a, uh, an agent that might protect against the development of ototoxicity and at the same time not protect against the chemotherapeutic effect. And then interventions after therapy. Cancer screening after therapy, as I mentioned, um, uh, should be a subject of research, in my opinion. Reproductive interventions after therapy are of um, increasing interest, including um, consideration of harvesting of ovarian tissue in survivors who might have some retained ovarian function but are at risk for premature ovarian failure. We need to understand how to transition our neuroblastoma survivors, just like our, uh, the rest of our survivors, to adult, onset ca adult health care. However, neuroblastoma, I bet, is a mystery to most um, uh, general internists, uh, uh, GPs, internists, gynecologists, and we will have to do some educating of our primary care providers of how to take care of neuroblastoma survivors. And I think it will be important to study patients who have participated in randomized clinical trials to look at their late effects. It gives us this um, wonderful opportunity to look at the difference between uh, one group of survivors and another group of survivors based upon what, uh, what we've exposed them to. I want to thank um, all of you for your attention and for the organizers for inviting me to uh, present this uh, overview of survivorship in neuroblastoma. I also want to thank my colleagues in the neuroblastoma and survivorship communities, including the COG Neuroblastoma Group, the INRG, the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, the COG Survivorship Committee, and thank the abstract presenters at ANR who thought about presenting survivorship data in the course of their presentations. Thank you.